And hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Ethnic Politics. Now, I'm sorry for getting this out to you later than normal. Um, I've just had a pretty hectic last couple of days, uh, but I promise you, this is a good one. Uh, the material for this week, if you read it, um, is something that I think all of you can find um, some familiarity with, especially um, when we are talking about the controversy surrounding symbols of the American Confederacy uh, that still dominate large parts of the American South. And, you know, by extension, I think that uh, we can certainly find something to understand with um, sort of embedded and entrenched narratives that marginalize um, a number of ethnic, racial, religious, and uh, cultural minorities uh, to the predominant WASP narrative uh, that uh, has effectively dominated and controlled American political culture uh, since much of its founding. So this week, um, which I'm not going to lie, is going to be some heavy-duty material stemming from our material from last week, looks at the use of cultural narratives in collective memory, identity, and values. And in, in coming up with a picture, uh, a cover picture, for this week's material, um, I decided on this rather unassuming and often um, overlooked uh, plaque, a uh, sign, a uh, monument uh, that you find in the financial district of Manhattan that would tell the passerby, if they happen to notice this sign, that uh, the area was once a major um, slave trading market. Um, in fact, um, if one of your readings you remember, New York City um, in its early years was second only to Charleston, South Carolina, uh, in terms of the number of slaves that came into New York Harbor uh, and were and was immediately, you know, put on display for purchase, uh, both for North and eventually the South. And, you know, for a city that constantly changes, and one that up until recently isn't really all that interested in preserving um, its history. In fact, uh, something that we'll talk about in a few weeks, um, the idea of preserving um, early New York history was really only something that happened or began sometime in the mid to late 60s. Um, any trace, right, any trace of the slave market in Wall Street today is completely gone, um, you know, paved over, uh, you know, what have you. Uh, this sign is, I think, somewhat of a rather paltry <laughs> attempt at um, identifying what was one of the primary um, sources of um, economic income. Uh, first for New Amsterdam and then uh, continuing on for New York City. And I guess this leads us to, you know, ask a rather poignant question. Why are some things remembered in a group and others forgotten? Right? Why do we remember um, some aspects of history but tend to overlook or, you know, forget others? Um, you know, why and how does it matter that some stories about the past are told and retold and others are ignored? I mean, this was a question that was asked at the very end of the Ross chapter this week. And to that, I would add, why is it that what we remember is oftentimes mythologized, embellished, um, and rather a significant departure from actual history? And this is not something that is particular to the United States, right? Most groups, most political groups around the world tend to gravitate towards more of a reconstructed aspect of memory than actual history. And I think it's because the reconstructed narratives give the group a better sense of importance or find ways for them to... Um, reconcile with some, you know, dark and uncomfortable past. And of course, in the United States, the big thing um, is slavery, which we're going to be talking about um, in this lecture. And I, you know, I want to say right off the bat here that while the bulk of this will focus on um, collective memories created in the post-Civil War South, you know, the South is not some unique phenomenon to this, right? The North is just as complicit in accepting these narratives of national unity, but white national unity as its southern counterparts, right? So as we're going to see, um, there's um, a heavy dosage of um, hegemonic American political culture that even if some of its adherents don't recognize this, place emphasis on white unity um, at the expense of the memories, the um, s sensitivities, and the grievances 
of others, right? And in this case, um, it is largely uh, this country's um, African American community. So we pick up almost exactly where we left off last week by noting a couple of things, right? The critical important role of narrative and symbol in collective memory and collective identities. And as a quick recap, right, you all remember that narrative is a conscious connection of previously unstructured and possibly even unrelated events, figures, and ideas into a seemingly implotted framework of logic and reference. And to that, symbols function as the tools of narrative, both tangible, as in the form of monuments, commemorations, and rituals, and intangible, such as feelings of belonging, patriotism, and tradition. And both narrative and symbol come together to basically create this concept of collective memory, right? In which you, if you remember, right, collective memory is not just what groups remember, but how they remember it, right? How they remember certain aspects of the past vis-a-vis -vis their position, their identities, and their values in the present. So collective memory is the emotional quality that we ascribe to events, places, people, symbols, and ideas, which will place particular emphasis on certain elements of the past while giving passing reference, downgrading, ignoring, or even denying others. This leads us to very convincingly hypothesize that collective memory is very much selective memory. And selective memory is something that most people in communities, again, not just the United States, consider to be their history. Right, so I'm pretty certain, I am, I am almost convinced that all of you at some point or another have had someone come up to you, have had a relative at the proverbial Thanksgiving dinner table or whatever, and say the following things to you. Quote, if you knew your history, comma, dot, 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 right? And you just be prepared for them to tell you something that you know is not really historical, but more so an interpretation of that history. But herein lies the fascinating and unbelievably mind-numbing reality of ethnicity, culture, and identity. People will oftentimes default to a myth than historical fact. And this is not something that you can just say, oh, well, that's the right for you. No, 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 no. This is across the board. Republicans, Democrats, right, center. Yes, I even have to say the left as well. Myths oftentimes are more attractive for people who want to feel correct about something than historical objectivity which more often than not kind of dispels most of these myths and um, sort of, um, you know, desacralizes something that people hold near and dear. And so the readings that I assigned this week <clears throat> can really be divided into two groups, right? The first ones are the ones that I highlighted in REM. Uh, the Henry Giro um, chapter, The Sandstorm, from America at War with Itself, really begins our exploration into the entrenched political culture of status quo America. And you, some of you may think that, you know, this entrenched culture might be overtly patriotic, tends to bristle at the, at the slightest thought of criticism, modification. Uh, it is a very top-down, um, almost um, authoritarian type of political culture that emphasizes national unity over everything else, right? And, and th this is, you know, full on display uh, with the new president and the new democratically controlled Congress uh, who seem to think that unity with Republicans is more important than pushing socioeconomic and sociopolitical reforms that many of these Republicans would find problematic, right? So, so this, this, this almost fixed obsession with making certain that everybody is harmoniously on the same page, um, you know, has its consequences and more often than not um, looks at dissension not as constructive criticism uh, but as literal threats to national security. Um, the roots of this can be found in the chapter uh, of Mark Howard Ross's Cultural Contestation in Ethnic Conflict, the, the chapter Flags, Heroes, and Statues, Inclusive versus Exclusive Identity Markers in the American South. And as I just said beforehand, <clears throat> right, the focus is on entrenched memories of um, how Southerners 
come to reconcile themselves with being what is effectively the losers of a civil war. But it's a series of narratives and collective memories that, at the absolute best, if they weren't challenged by elements in the North, they were just kind of tolerated and just said, all right, you know, we'll just ignore them for the sake of national unity. To this, there are three shorter articles, um, articles that add to our general understanding of these narratives. Uh, Thomas Segrew, Restoring King, which talks about the many narratives and memories, uh, reconstructed memories of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, Adam Servers, The Myth of the Kindly General Lee. Um, this was written at a time when the Black Lives Matter movement was really beginning to pick up, and we started to see um, you know, active protest against uh, what was still blatant uh, cons you know, Confederate uh, symbolism uh, in many Southern states, right? The, um, you know, the so-called Confederate flag, many statues of Confederate soldiers and generals. Um, and, you know, the idea that the Internet is, uh, you know, a vessel that challenges prevailing um, and, you know, erstwhile unassailable understandings of many of these characters. So in the same way that we talked about uh, the demystifying of Christopher Columbus last week, um, so too we look at um, a more historically, um, you know, accurate uh, portrayal, uh, portrayal of General Lee. Um, and then finally, um, um, a sort of standalone but still relatable article by Russell Shorto, uh, How Christian Were the Founders, um, examines attempts by, um, among other places, the Texas Board of Education to effectively rewrite American history as something that was inherently evangelical, right, evangelically Christian, um, with curriculum that not only challenges the prevailing understandings of the separation of church and state, but seeks to teach kids that this idea is really a deviation from the original intentions of the founding fathers who, according to these new print capitalists, um, were you know, staunch religiously um, you know, evangelical individuals who wanted um, this country to be founded on you know, Judeo-Christian principles. And if you think to yourself, this has no root in history, and this kind of sounds very similar to something that Trump tried to do uh, in the last few days of his uh, presidency, and uh, this was kind of widely condemned and ridiculed, um, I got some bad news for you. This stuff has been going on now for years. Um, if not decades, just kind of behind the scenes. Um, and there are many places in the United States that unfortunately uh, teach this type of curriculum, which in a way you almost have to give these individuals credit for being this um, creative and savvy, uh, but they operate unchallenged because they know that gaining access to organizations like the Board of Education, something that nobody really pays attention to, um, gives them the ability to effectively decide what will be taught and how it will be taught. Um, you know, so the concept of print capitalism is something that is not just uh, a 19th century phenomenon in the foundation of states, but something that is happening you know, even today. So the idea of narrative and symbol and institutionalized memory is something that is active, actively happening in countries like the U.S. and elsewhere. So I'm hoping that by this point, right, you will have already have read these articles, um, and I'm pretty certain that Segru, Russell, and Server uh, were much more um, understandable. But I'm pretty certain also that Ross and Giro uh, were also rather clear, uh, particularly in bringing up information that is really front and center, right? We're really talking about current events. Um, in the country today. So our agenda for this lecture is that I want to first identify some of the underlying narratives and symbols that define the predominant elements of American political culture. And these underlying um, narratives uh, that lead to these elements are something that Giraud and others um, it's kind of referred to as inverted totalitarianism. Now, you know, before you all get off thinking that I'm trying to tell you that America is, you know, authoritarian or any of that kind of stuff, no, no, no. The term inverted totalitarian is really meant to describe this top-down, um, commodified, corporate-run set of beliefs that are as omnipresent 
as they seem to be at this point matter of fact. And you know, we'll get to more specifics as it comes. But what I also want to do is take a step back and look at the historical origins and rationales of some earlier narratives that go into this type of top-down um, element of American patriotism, and one of which is the rather um, developed lost cause narrative, right? the so-called lost cause narrative and its relationship with other collective memories. So within this, we look at the mythology of Robert E. Lee, um, the eventual depolitization and commodification of Martin Luther King to the point where you know, he is remembered only once a year in some innocuous holiday that, you know, everyone gets off for the day and a couple of, you know, woke liberals will, you know, post his I have a dream speech on Facebook and feel good about themselves. And then finally is the pervasive collective memories of America founded on evangelically Christian principles and philosophies. Now, I understand that the bulk of my audience is rooted in the New York metropolitan area. So this might seem a bit far-fetched. We tend to forget that there are large parts of this country that operate way outside many of these global metropolitan areas and are overlooked. They're oftentimes ridiculed and derided and ignored by the East and the West coasts. Therefore, they're perfectly happy to kind of do their own thing, write their own histories, believe their own narratives. And, you know, in the same way that, you know, people get really, really surprised when they find out that a lot of people in the American South still refer to the Civil War as the War of Northern Aggression and think of Lee and Stonewall Jackson and Jefferson Davis as national heroes as opposed to traitors and look at Lincoln as more problematic. I mean, it, it's, it's not that these people are stupid. It's that this has been the pervasive culture as system that has been part of their curriculum and with monuments and symbols and commemorations and reenactments and people proud that their ancestors fought in the Confederate army, um, this doesn't become controversial at all. It becomes part of one's quote unquote heritage, a heritage that today is you know, certainly coming under scrutiny, but still a heritage that many people hold on to and consider to be part of their family legacy. So there's a lot of things for us to examine in this lecture. And so we begin rather critically by looking at what Henry Giraud identifies as an overarching narrative of American patriotism, which the specific narratives aren't necessarily as problematic as the pervasiveness of the narrative is, sort of the historical memory. So again, remember the difference between collective and historical memory. Historical memory is state-sponsored collective memory. So it's a way of thinking that the state and state authorities effectively want as many people as possible to think and take as matter-of-factly. And this is a type of what um, you know, Giraud and Sheldon Wolin and Hannah Arendt and others have uh, collectively noted as inverted totalitarianism. Right? It's uh, somewhat of a controversial word, um, especially when we attach it not just to the United States, but to American political culture. Because you think to yourself, authoritarianism exists everywhere on the planet except America, right? especially if you're one of those American patriots. But inverted totalitarianism is a way of describing um, you know, a type of thinking in which corporations have controlled and subverted democracy and where economic development is superior to political accountability. So it is not the type of classic totalitarianism that many people um, immediately think of, like you know, Big Brother or Thought Police or Hitler or Stalin or anything else like that, right? But the totalitarianism of inverted totalitarianism is the understanding that um, collective identity, or at least the accepted way of, th of thinking, the official reading of history and identity, um, is largely now in the hands of major um, marketing firms, um, corporate interests that are tied to big government, and the, you know, sort of the understanding that all of life's solutions can be found in market solutions, right? So economic development is superior to political accountability is unfortunately one of the darker um, symptoms 
of neoliberalism. So in this sense, you know, all aspects of life are commodified and exploited in the name of consumerism and self-gratification as a way of lulling citizens to abrogate their liberties and participation in the political process. Now, Giraud has been um, rep you know, repetitive in noting this, you know, book after book, article after article. Um, and, you know, to that, um, you know, we can add Sheldon Wolin, um, historically Hannah Arendt, uh, Zygmunt Bauman. Um, these are, you know, thinkers who are lamenting the idea that the concept of democracy in America, the idea of civic responsibility, community investment, um, free thinking is now in many ways privatized, right? We are told what to think, what to buy, um, what to believe, what to denigrate by not just market forces, but by news sources passing themselves off as forms of information, but they've already been effectively bought out by lobbyists and other um, you know, market target firms and corporations. So in this sense, democracy is managed it is a managed type of democracy through narratives of largely white-oriented patriotism, defense of the political status quo, deification of the military, and repeated demonization and scapegoating on any group, internal or external, that presents a real or increasingly perceived threat to national identity and national ideals. Let me repeat that again. This overarching narrative of American patriotism is that patriotism is largely defined by white-oriented, um, specifically WASP-oriented concepts of loyalty to country and adherence to authority. In this sense, the status quo, the political status quo, is vociferously defended. Hence the, if you've, if you've noticed this, right, the, just the collective rejoicing among most mainstream media outlets at uh, Biden's inauguration, and the idea that there's a lot of things that are continuing under Biden that happened under Trump, but we're not worried about that anymore. Because Trump was seen as the deviant, Biden is going to make everything perfect. At least that's the narrative that we are told. Within that, right, within that defense of the status quo, we have a constant deification of the military, right? And this is on full display, not only in the national symbols that are used, but also the idea that the military has kind of seeped itself into um, pop culture through video games, through sporting events, uh, through routine practices of pledges of allegiances in school, right? If, if any of you, you know, come from other countries or any of you who are listening in are from other countries, and I've, I've asked other people, does anybody outside the United States do a pledge of allegiance in school? And they kind of look at me and they're like, no, no, man, that's just weird. Like, why would you do that, right? And for us, I remember, you know, going through grade school. I mean, this was just routine. And... Um, you know, I think it was around my sophomore, junior year where there were, you know, some students that didn't want to do the Pledge of Allegiance and we didn't know why. And back then it may be just because they were lazy or whatever, but even the teachers were chiding them in class by saying you have to stand and show your love of country. So it's like when people decide that they don't want to do the Pledge of Allegiance, when they don't want to, you know, sing the national anthem at every single sporting event, right, the burden is on them to prove their loyalty, to prove their patriotism. And maybe they just don't care about it, but all of a sudden they're, you know, deviant, um, you know, insidious agents of, you know, America's decline. So repeated demonization and scapegoating of, you know, on any group, internal or external, that presents a real or perceived threat to national identity and national ideals. In this sense, external threats to the country necessitate strong adherence to hegemony. And whether these threats are coming from China or Russia or Iran or North Korea or Mexico or, you know, wherever, we don't know, okay? The idea is that the country needs to remain vigilant and the hegemonic status quo cannot be compromised. Um, it's even worse when we perceive these threats as internal contagion so when we find that there are restless groups within the country, 
And this is oftentimes, um, you know, known to be um, either, you know, disloyal minorities or increasingly, increasingly the disloyal political left, right? You'll notice that, you know, whenever there's a problem, we'll blame it on Antifa, we'll blame it on communists and socialists, we'll blame it on um, all sorts of people that we use these terms to describe individuals or groups that just simply hate America. And therefore, they need to be marginalized and they need to be demobilized, right? All alternatives, any alternatives to the status quo, if they cannot be co-opted into the status quo, need to be derailed. And at the risk of kind of sounding a little bit more risky, that is one of the primary reasons why Bernie Sanders' campaign, both in 2016 and 2020, was seen as a bigger threat to the Democratic Party than Donald Trump's. Because at the end of the day, Donald Trump in 2016 was seen as a show horse opposition for Hillary to beat. Bernie was seen as much more problematic because he had the nasty propensity of raising a lot of good points. And you'll find about a year ago, you know, I'm recording this lecture in mid-February, you'll notice, if you'll remember, a year ago in 2020, before everything you know happened, Bernie was at this point on a roll. He was winning primaries and was on his way to effectively securing the nomination. Joe Biden was, you know, nowhere, fourth place, fifth place, whatever it was, until the Democratic Party realized they had one last chance to scuttle his campaign and put a more loyal status quo adherent like Biden or anyone else um, in the driver's seat. Now, some people, you know, who you know, find that problematic, would say that's a conspiracy theory. Um, but there is ample evidence to suggest, right, that Obama and other Democratic um, elites stepped in to scuttle Bernie's campaign for one very important reason. Bernie was seen as a threat to this political status quo. And therefore, he needed to be marginalized sooner than later. So this overarching narrative of American patriotism, right, um, has produced um, a number of long-lasting legacies, right? So this is not something that we just kind of make up now in 2020, 2021, but we've seen, right, that these things persist in American political culture for at least the last 20, 30, maybe even 40 or so years. And that is, you know, a culture of neoliberalism that subordinates socio-political problems to market solutions. So in other words, urban blight, um, crime on the rise in one's neighborhood? Could it be the deterioration of social welfare programs? Could it be that there are uh, or were a number of existing uh, civic groups that you know might have handled the situation but have now been defunded? Who cares about that? How do we deal with urban blight? Gentrification, right? That's just simple. You know, put in a Trader Joe's, put in a Costco, put in a Taco Bell, put in a um, um, Olive Garden. Eventually, we'll raise the price of rent and living expenses up. We'll force the people that we don't want out of the neighborhood. And this is how Brooklyn has kind of reclaimed many, many uh, erstwhile problematic zip codes, right? So in this sense, civic discourse has effectively been bought by private enterprise, right? That's the whole thing. Retail solves everything. The market will solve all of one's problems. And if you have the money for it, well, then great. If you can afford these new luxury condos, if you can afford the rent going up in your neighborhood, well, then what do you really care? But if you find yourself being squeezed out of your living area, you find out being that you're unable to make ends meet and there's no social safety net, unemployment has been cut for the sake of austerity, well then that's now your problem because you just don't believe in yourself enough, right? This is the, sort of the concept of neoliberalism. It atomizes and individualizes all of us. And it sort of kills the notion of community service, and community cohesion. Now, as a way of offsetting that, right, managed patriotism kind of blankets all of that over with an overt glorification of the military and the constructed infallibility of liberal elitism. Now, what do I mean by that? And what I mean here is that the military, regardless of whether one is Republican or Democrat, and what's interesting is that people tend to forget that Democrats, especially mainstream liberal Democrats, absolutely love the military. They use the military as a way of proving to their conservative opponents and skeptics that they are just as patriotic 
as any, you know, red-blooded, meat-eating conservative is, right? Presidents like Obama and Clinton, and I would definitely venture to hypothesize Biden, will spend inordinate amounts of money um, upgrading the military and using the military to, you know, establish some type of American hegemony abroad. And while doing that, there's also a way of somehow shoring up this notion of, you know, liberal elitism, the idea that there are certain people in the country, intellectuals, lawyers, thinkers, you know, woke individuals that know how to operate and run the country better than anyone else, which is one of the reason why whenever there is a problem in the country, if you'll notice over the past couple of years, there's just people that will just tongue in cheek without even checking their notes just blame it on Russia. You know, Russiagate, right? Trump won because of Russia. Hillary lost because of Russia. Bernie has supporters because of Russia. Um, the weather, we have so much more snow uh, right now because of Russia. We have global warming because of Russia, right? It's just blame it on, it's, it's scapegoating because nothing can happen to the status quo because the status quo is infallible. The status quo cannot be replaced. It might come under attack by people like Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders and Nina Turner and Ralph Nader um, and, you know, people before them like Dennis Kucinich. And there can be a whole bunch of, you know, critical podcasts, both on the progressive left and on the Q and on right. <clears throat> and so the beleaguered, you know, New York Times reading, Washington Post subscribing, tote bag carrying, brunch eating liberal feels that the country that they've worked so hard to achieve living in this affluent neighborhood is now coming under attack by a whole bunch of people who are just unhappy with their unfortunate lot in life. So rather than say that the situation is a result of neoliberalism, it's just a result of outside, you know, uh, interference. And Russia just kind of fits the bill, um, you know, however way that you want to do this. So in this case, right, challenges to the status quo by political or racial minorities are going to be immediately met with suspicion, derision, and contempt, right? Some of these groups might initially be attempted to be co-opted. Right. I mean, if we can somehow take what is an otherwise um, legitimate grievance by a racial minority, um, a gender group, um, a linguistic, a cultural or religious minority, and I don't know, put um, a hashtag next to it, um, turn it into something that everyone on social media just kind of shares and, you know, puts a little watermark on their profile picture, gets, uh, I don't know, you know, Alyssa Milano or M Megan McCain to, you know, get behind, um, you know, we defang it. You know, we get rid of the actual need for addressing an issue and we just turn it into performance politics. So if we can co-opt it, fine then it's no longer an issue and the status quo can make it look like they actually care about people while doing absolutely nothing. But if the group says we're not for sale, if the group says no, we are not going to be appropriated by white liberal bourgeoisie for your own self-gratification, then the group is immediately denigrated, targeted, downgraded, you know, and, you know, in a way tries to be demobilized, right? And this leads to something that I, you know, I recall, I, I do this in my comparative politics class, where I assign a small chapter in Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. Uh, it's an essay called The Power Exercised by the Majority of America Over Thought. And this is effectively a pattern that has existed almost since the founding of the country. In other words, dissension from majority thinking is going to be turned irrelevant. That's the big thing. We cannot and we oftentimes will not incarcerate or you know, subpoena you because it makes us look bad. But if we can turn dissension, legitimate dissension, into conspiracy theories, into the loony rantings of a radical and unpopular fringe, then that's exactly what we're going to do. If we can take a legitimate grievance, if we can take um, the leader of a movement calling for significant socioeconomic and sociopolitical change and turn them into the raving lunatic that yells at traffic in front of the local post office, then the status quo has been successfully defended. 
Now, I did not assign Tocqueville's uh, power exercised by the majority, but there's a segment here that I want to read to you. Um, and this is some pretty heavy-duty stuff here. So listen up here. Tocqueville writes, In America, the majority has staked out a formidable fence around thought. Inside those limits, a writer is free, but woe betide him if he dares to stray from them. Not that he need fear and hote de fe, but he is the victim of all kinds of unpleasantness and everyday persecutions. A political career is closed to him, for he has offended the only power with the capacity to give him an opening. He is denied everything, including renown. Before publishing his views, he thought he had supporters. It seems he has lost them once he has declared himself publicly. For his detractors speak out loudly, and those who think as he does, but without his courage, keep silent and slink away. He gives in and finally bends beneath the effort of each passing day, withdrawing into silence as if he felt ashamed at having spoken the truth. Formerly, tyranny employed chains and executioners as its crude weapons. But nowadays, civilization has civilized despotism itself, even though it appeared to have nothing else to learn. Princes had, so to speak, turned violence into a physical thing, but our democratic republics have made it into something as intellectual as the human will it intends to restrict. This is good stuff. Under the absolute government of one man, despotism, in order to attack the spirit, crudely struck the body and the spirit escaped free of its blows, rising gloriously above it. But in democratic republics, Tyranny does not behave in that manner. No, it leaves the body alone and goes straight to the spirit. No longer does the master say, you will think as I do or you will die. Instead, he says, you are free to not think like me. Your life, property, everything will be untouched. But from today, you are a pariah among us. You will retain your civic privileges, but they will be useless to you. For if you seek the votes of your fellow citizens, they will not grant you them. And if you seek simply their esteem, they will pretend to refuse you that too. You will retain your place among men, but you will lose the rights of mankind. When you approach your fellows, they will shun you like an impure creature. And those who believe in your innocence will be the very people to abandon you lest they be shunned in their turn. Go in peace. I grant you your life, but it is a life worse than death. Now that's some heavy duty stuff right there. But Tocqueville is effectively writing in the early 19th century what Giraud, Arendt, Wolin, and others are noting two centuries later. Right? The idea that managed patriotism has created this sense of with us or against us, part of the system, antagonistic to the system. And I'm sure, right, I am sure that you have, you know, had an argument with someone who you know, believes much more in a centrist status quo than what you might believe, right? Now, if I'm, you know, if, if my audience here tends to be more people on the progressive left or some people more on the conservative right, like you begin to realize that right, you gotta, you know, keep your words to yourselves. You gotta make certain that you don't stand out. Otherwise, you end up defending yourself more than trying to advance a certain point. So this lasting legacy of managed patriotism has created this us them inclusive versus exclusive form of political culture, a series of narratives within the country. And these things kind of begin, I would say, um, really, really take off following the Civil War. Um, and I think it was largely because of this need, this absolute persistent need to achieve American unity within the period of Reconstruction. Right. I think one of the more long lasting effects of the pre-Civil War era wasn't the Civil War itself, wasn't even the notion of slavery, but the institutional aftershocks of Reconstruction, which, you know, if you remember from your high school U.S. history classes, effectively was the following. Reconstruction was effectively the following. The, you know, the, the federal government in Washington says to the former defeated Confederate states, in so many words, Listen, do you think you could just kind of be the Confederacy, but without seceding from the U.S.? You know, like you want to, you can't have slaves, right? That much is certain. We, we, you know, slavery is done. But, 
you know, you want to create sort of local rules and politics and regulations that, you know, put you whites above blacks. You know, listen, I'm not going to, you know, get all uptight about that. What I really want is unity. What I really want is reincorporation of these states into a united whole, right? And we kind of learn sort of tongue-in-cheek euphemistically that the Reconstruction was a way of reconciling and healing and bringing the country together, right? You know, that statement that before the Civil War, or, um, we said that, you know, the United States, um, you know, um, what is it? The United States are America. Afterwards, the United States is America. Something like that. I, I don't remember exactly, right? But these narratives of unity are really directed towards whites, right? Blacks, not included at all. Other minorities, not included at all, right? The Reconstruction was really, if anything, um, an ideological rehabilitation of the post-Confederate South um, at the direct expense of newly emancipated blacks. So the understanding was you're no longer slaves, right? Make something of yourself. Um, but there's really not going to be any um, real institutional help. And as soon as, you know, Southern whites kind of regain their uh, political footing, you know, they can do whatever they want, um, as long as they don't secede, you know, from the Union. And within this sense of managed patriotism and this, you know, search for unity within, you know, what is really um, a, a multi-ethnic, multilinguistic, multi-ideological uh, um, conglomerate of people living in a country, um, narratives of true versus disloyal Americans began to take shape. Right, us versus them, patriotic versus disloyal, um, you know, American loving versus socialist adherents, um, you know, conservative versus um, labor, uh, working class versus traditional class, right? And it's really all based on um, a series of narratives that envelop white, specifically WASP ethnocentricity, um, religion, which is increasingly evangelical Christianity as the connecting cultural glue. Um, not Christianity in general, but a particular brand of Protestantism. And, you know, with that said, what of the minorities, right? What of blacks and women and Asians and, uh, and Jews and others? Minorities, while not officially stated as such, minorities are judged according to outgroup perceptions of character and mannerisms, right? So hence... Um, the way in which today Martin Luther King is accepted as a cultural icon in this country, even by some of the most virulently conservative Republicans. Why? Because Martin Luther King has been, you know, sort of reconstructed to be the ideal, genteel, soft-spoken um, black, whereas Malcolm X was, you know, increasingly belligerent, increasingly antagonistic. Now, mind you, Martin Luther King would have little to nothing to do with many of the American officials today, both Democrat as well as Republican. In fact, if we know one of the things that King wrote about, he said that the, if there's one person in America worse than the unrepentant member of the KKK, it's the moderate liberal who will do more to find unity with that KKK member than with members of the black community, right? The member of the KKK is actually almost honest. The moderate liberal will disappoint in the end. They'll make you, they'll, they'll make you feel like they hear you and they care about you, but in the end, they're going to compromise for the sake of, once again, unity, bipartisan compromise, right? So it's the same type of thing. So the narrative of true versus disloyal even works today in modern American politics, right? The true American will reach across the aisle and work with Mitch McConnell, no matter how repugnant and repulsive he is. The true American will look to the unapologetic uh, Trump supporter and say, you are my brother, as opposed to, right, the members of Antifa, the members of um, the new left, that are basically saying, you want unity, we got to purge the Republicans first. These guys are hardcore authoritarians. This type of thinking is seen by mainstream America as far more dangerous because it perpetuates this narrative of disunity, disharmony, right? So this is one of the underlying narratives that defines um, political culture in the United States. 
And a large part of this culture, right, is rooted in an historically important narrative, which we've already discussed, called the Lost Cause narrative, right? The Lost Cause narrative, as mentioned in both the uh, Ross and the server readings, is a reconstructed post-war assessment of the legacies of the Civil War and slavery, right? It's effectively a way of the South coming to terms with two things. A, they lost a war, and B, they lost a war and they lost their slaves. Um, and what to make of it moving forward. Um, you know, within the studies of post-war reconciliation, you know, there is you know, a growing body of literature that kind of looks at how do people who lost a war uh, make sense of the new world around them, right? And this is particularly problematic in civil wars because if you lose a civil war, you basically have to live with the very people that you were fighting and killing um, a week, a month uh, ago prior, right? If it's, you know, between two countries, you can kind of, you know, go back to your own territory, lick your wounds and rewrite your own history. And, and trust me, this stuff happens. But within a civil war context, how do the losers go on, right? How do they make sense of their world? The Lost Cause narrative is basically rooted on three general principles. Number one, the Civil War was not about slavery, but states' rights, right? This was kind of a way of distancing um, themselves from the now highly unpopular uh, concept of slavery, right? And you, you'll find people in comment sections on, uh, you know, internet uh, articles constantly saying that, right? Oh, the war wasn't about slavery, it was about states' rights, which... In, in a way, is not entirely incorrect, right? You can think about this in a way by saying that the United States was increasingly becoming more and more federalized, and certain states wanted to keep their, you know, individual rights. But here's the problem, though. Even if we accept that argument that it was states' rights and not slavery, it was the states' rights to perpetuate the concept of slavery, right? It's, it's like, you know, so you just added one extra layer. So it's not that we, you know, we're fighting this war, we broke away because we like our slaves. No, we, we fought, a, we, we broke away because of states' rights. But states' rights to do what? To own slaves. So it still comes back to that, but, you know, it adds that extra layer, that, that extra piece of distance to say, well, it's about states' rights, of which slavery was, you know, a part of it. Oh, and by the way, as far as slaves were concerned, right? Slaves were looked after, and they were taken care of. That's another thing that the Lost Cause narrative wants you to believe, right? That slave owners were benevolent because, well, you're not going to abuse what is effectively your property, right? Um, you're supposed to be chivalrous. You're supposed to be um, providing them a benefit, right? The Lost Cause narrative also um, you know, extends this understanding that the best thing that ever happened to these people, yes, quote-unquote, these people, was that they came to America. You know, we took them out of the savage world of Africa and we put a roof over their head, we put clothes on their back, and we gave them a Bible to hold, right? That was the thing. It was kind of a white man's burden. And even though slavery itself is something that we don't want to go back to visit, you know, we'd like to think that we helped them out. And maybe they should be a little thankful for that, right? It's, again, this is the narrative, the Lost Cause narrative, right? Now, the, the lost in Lost Cause is also important to understand because the war was already in the North's favor from the moment war broke out, right? The war was lost because of superior Northern numbers and resources. Um, in a way, this can also be seen as somewhat debatable, um, somewhat you know, non-problematic in the idea that, yes, if we think about the Civil War from a strictly economic point of view. The South represents pre-modern agrarianism. The North increasingly comes to represent the new emerging industrial era. So the North had better weapons. They had better machinery. They were much more automated at the time. 
right? In fact, um, one of the movies uh, that uh, depicted the Civil War at the time, I'm going to mention it very uh, soon, Gone with the Wind, um, in the beginning of the movie, there's this scene where um, uh, Rhett Butler, um, you know, was played by Clark Gable. He's apparently, um, you know, some war profiteer, and he's down in Atlanta talking with a bunch of, you know, Southern aristocrats about how they can't wait for the war to begin, and they can't wait to lick, you know, the Yankees and, you know, chase them back uh, north to the Potomac. And, uh, you know, Rhett Butler is saying, look, if this war begins, you guys are going to lose. The North has better weapons. They have better machinery. They're far better equipped. And, of course, he's, you know, seen as um, someone who doesn't know what he's talking about. But this is the idea, right? The war was lost um, from the beginning. And therefore, the South didn't lose because they were war soldiers. They were just outnumbered, outgunned. It was one of those last stand type of things. So these three elements that go into the lost cause right narrative right is a way of i don't even want to say reconciling the south but rehabilitating memories of the south so rather than just simply writing off the confederacy as a collection of treasonous states that wanted to preserve an archaic and unbelievably immoral practice of human bondage the south is going to be rewritten in some kind of tragic yet still noble light. And, you know, as physical memory of the war dies out and younger generations have no connection to it, right, the nostalgia for this period is going to take on greater and greater attractiveness. And look, I gotta again say that even though this was largely an invention within Southern political elites, um, this was effectively allowed to be disseminated throughout the South um, by the North as part of the Reconstruction uh, process, right? So I don't want you to think that the North was actively uh, opposing this. They didn't really care. As far as the North was concerned, as far as Lincoln and his successors were concerned, right? As long as the South gets reincorporated into the Union, they don't give a damn how it happens. They just want unity again, right? So the North is going to not really care about what the South is thinking of, right? The war is over. Industry has prevailed over agriculture. Um, African Americans are still going to be largely marginalized. The country is saved. White unity has been preserved. You think whatever you want to think, effectively says the North. Now, the narrative in this sense is not just created, but disseminated and spread right, through a number of institutions and active socio-political elites. So, you know, one of the big aspects is that former Confederate veterans were effectively allowed to praise and glorify Southern soldiers, especially the fallen, as defenders of a way of life. So that is the reason why there remains, you know, Confederate war graves, Confederate war memorials, um, you know, old age homes for Confederate veterans, right? So we're not talking about the deinstitutionalization of the Confederacy. We're just simply talking about it being reattached to the Union. And within each of these states, you still want to have the levers of power, the power elites, the different levels of authority you know, go right ahead. And the fact that Confederate veterans were effectively allowed to continue to carry their medals, wear their uniforms, and perpetuate their own stories and events certainly lends credibility to this Lost Cause narrative. Um, what is even more so is that the Lost Cause begins to take on um, you know, much more traction by the 1880s and the 1890s. So this is not one of those immediately following the wars, but like once a generation uh, you know, sort of replaces the other one, the idea of the Confederacy as this idyllic bulwark, uh, sort of against the changing social and political pressures of industrialism, um, is sort of a mental salve for many Southerners, right? Particularly, right, the late 19th, early 20th century, um, the United States is, you know, on full course for industrialization. Labor becomes far more organized, far more militant. Um, there's a whole bunch of new political philosophies. Marxism makes a big thing uh, in the United States. We tend to forget that, right? So the Confederacy is something archaic, almost aristocratic, right? It's nostalgia, for a simpler, more honorable time. 
And, you know, for those that have no working memory of the Confederacy, it's pretty easy for one to get nostalgic for, you know, the good old days, the golden age of the South, as opposed to where it is at the contemporary period. Third is the establishment of historical committees. Now, here's where things get, you know, a bit more interesting. Historical committees, groups of people, the, you know, the daughters of Confederate veterans, the sons of Confederate veterans, um, former Confederate politicians and generals that are not forced into retirement, but continue to be active, go on speaking circuits. Um, all of these groups seize control of all forms of information and discussion about the Confederacy as a way of safeguarding it against criticism and historical objectivity. Now, you might think to yourself, well, aren't there academics in the North that want to challenge this? Maybe they were, but either A, they just found themselves to be stonewalled whenever they tried to do research in the South, or more often than not, they realized, who cares, right? Who cares about what a bunch of losers think? If this helps them get through the day, so be it. But because memory was effectively monopolized by former Confederate print capitalists, they effectively gained primary control over how it was taught in schools, over how it was discussed in the public sphere, over how it was taught to kids, and how people, one, two, three generations later, grew to feel proud that their father, their grandfather, their great-grandfather fought in what was effectively a seceding treasonous army, but was still part of their own heritage. So again, the control of information also leads to the control of the narrative. Part of that, as I've already mentioned, is rewriting the history of the South and the Confederacy as a unit, as noble, aristocratic, and idyllic, right? And again, from a political economic standpoint, right, the American South, the, the, the pre-war South, had far more indications of landed aristocracy than we have in the North. The North was already, you know, urbanizing, industrializing. The South grew through commercial agriculture, right? So, you know, by the 1840s, 1850s, um, again, from a strictly economic point of view, global demand for cotton almost necessitated the perpetuation of slavery. Now, you could go into, um, you know, academic journals as recent as the 1930s, and you might be able to even find articles there that don't apologize for slavery, but try to explain why slavery lasted as long as it did, right? So if one of the primary export items of the United States was cotton, and we're talking about cotton to Europe, uh, you know, Western, Eastern Europe, you know, South America, wherever it is, right? The demand for cotton meant that there must have been a, you know, a, a, you know, a huge demand for the production. Keeping the cost at a certain level to avoid any other competition necessitated slavery, right? Because what do you do with slavery? You don't pay them at all, right? So the demand for this product kind of kept this institutional legacy going. And rather than just simply saying, well, the South did this because of good economic sense, um, which, by the way, prior to this, unless you were an abolitionist in the North, you didn't care one bit at all. You didn't really care at all about slavery. If you were a profiteer, if you were um, you know, a big financial investor, a banker, whatever, you had no problem with slavery because it meant money in your pocket as well. But now rewriting the history of the South away from this type of feudalism to a type of um, lauded romantic aristocracy uh, was something that began to take form uh, at the turn of the previous century. And, you know, all of this was done effectively to reinforce white supremacy through a whitewashing of crimes, pun is slightly intended there, whitewashing of crimes depicting images of the faithful slave in an effort to promote Southern pride and Southern heritage in an era of Southern economic decline and marginalization. So, you know, by the first two decades of the 1900s, okay, the Lost Cause narrative had, in many ways, done a significant job in rewriting the history of the South and the idea of the Civil War. Um, 
not just as a way of burying the crimes, the racism, the lynching, the family separations, the rape, the murder, the corporeal punishment. No, no, no. All of that was, you know, whatever. The slave was refashioned to be faithful, um, simplistic, yet honorable, you know, kind of the, you know, the, um, the harmless, good-natured black, you know. Um, I think that this was definitely depicted um, in that Disney uh, series of cartoons that you'll never see on DVD or Disney+, Plus, Songs of the South, uh, in which the whole show was hosted by Uncle Remus, right? Uncle Remus, an old, grandfatherly, um, genteel-looking black um, Southerner who may very well at one point have been a slave himself, right? Wearing simple clothes and walking through wheat fields, you know, teaching children the songs of the South or whatever it is, right? So, you know, the black has been kind of defanged, uh, desacralized from this, um, you know, um, bonded individual to someone who enjoyed their lot in life at the time, right? They got to be outside, they worked in the fields, they were grateful for uh, their, you know, master taking care of them. Again, in Gone with the Wind, one of the primary characters was Mammy, who was, you know, one of the main slaves of the plantation uh, Tara. And even after the war ended, she stays on <clears throat> and stays with the O'Hara family, right? And this is kind of a way of showing, you know, the slave is loyal to the family that they um, live with and work with. So as you can see from what we talked about last week, right, there's a lot of print capitalism going into the creation and the dissemination of this narrative to the point where in a couple of decades, it becomes just simply accepted as matter of fact. Um, your readings note that uh, particularly by the 1920s, so we're talking here now about 50 or so years from the end of the Civil War. So there are some veterans that are still alive, but, you know, they're entering into really the final years of their life. Uh, there is efforts made by many of these southern groups to erect monuments and war memorials uh, to Civil War soldiers. And while the bulk of these monuments um, are directly in honor and memory of particular Confederate generals and, pre and, and, and leaders like Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, Stonewall Jackson, and uh, John C. Calhoun, even, you know, even uh, statesmen in that sense, right? We even begin to see the creation of these rather vague war memorials for the fallen fighters, the fallen soldiers, um, of the Civil War, right? So, the, the, you know, the militarization as a way of bringing both North and South together. And it's here in the later years that we see the symbolization of what we now call the Confederate flag, right? But it's really the Confederate battle flag, right? A battle flag, you know, the stars and bars, you know, the, the, the cross of St. Andrew with uh, the stars that are within the field of blue. Um, and these are seen, right, at larger military commemorations of fallen soldiers because it was um, specifically a military battle flag. It was not a political flag. It was not the state flag of the Confederacy. And at this point, it was kind of seen as a way of showing commonality with their military compatriots on the northern side. So at this point, right, the Confederate flag, it, the one that we're talking about, is still very much a uh, military symbol. It doesn't take on the, um, the racism, the white supremacy, the political connotations that it now carries uh, today. Although to be fair, right, Confederate memorabilia, symbolism, flags, and other elements Right, were all disseminated through the organized leadership of really three groups. Uh, the United Confederate Veterans, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, and you've heard of this one, right, the Ku Klux Klan. And this gives them, um, you know, in addition to a monopoly on the way in which the narrative is going to be told, they also enjoy, right, access to political power, printed information, and public office. Again, it's one of those uh, embarrassing elements of American history that the KKK is not, and you know, throughout much of its history, never really was 
simply an organization of slack-jawed, partially intellectual, you know, hillbillies. No, far from it. The Klan uh, included um, intellectuals, academics, lawyers, doctors, statesmen, judges, police officers, right? people who achieved high-ranking degrees of power. Um, might have been, you know, court judge by day, uh, put on your white sheet and be grand wizard at night. Um, and this is just one of those things, you know, the Klan had actually achieved um, levels of power that even entered into Washington. So they had not only access to political authority, but they had access to the ways in which information is disseminated through newspapers and journals, movies, radio, and then eventually television. In fact, and I don't want to make you think that Gamut the Wind is a product of the Klan, but one of the best ways of sort of perpetuating this new, recon no, re literally reconstructed South as this idyllic um, era of gentlemen and, you know, large plantations and rolling fields and, you know, big sunsets or whatever it is, right, came through the movie Gamut the Wind which takes place almost entirely um, in the South and focuses on the trials and tribulations of, you know, a rather well-to-do uh, plantation family. And it's kind of like a romance movie that, you know, happens uh, both before, during, and after uh, the Civil War. But the movie begins by showing the viewer that this takes place back in a time that is now lost, right? It opens up with this um, very emotional and poetic visuals that kind of depict the South as something that is tragically lost, right? Something that once was. It was a golden age of chivalry and gallantry, and now it's just a memory, you know, a memory that is depicted in the following way. Right, so as the movie opens, right, we get this beautiful panoramic view of the South, right? This, this lush landscape, you know, um, in twilight. And the following um, words, the following text, you know, scrolls over the screen from bottom to top. There was a land of cavaliers and cotton fields called the Old South. Here in this pretty world, gallantry took its last bow. Here was the last ever to be seen of knights and their ladies fair, of master and of slave. Look for it only in books, for it is no more than a dream remembered, a civilization gone with the wind. Well, you know, and I would imagine for people who watched it in the 1930s, right, they may very well have felt a sense of sadness, a sense of pity at what was lost. You know, for people today, um, you know, engaged in... Uh, demystifying and removing these Confederate monuments, you read that opening crawl and you're saying, oh, it's gone with the wind, and your response would be like, yeah, and good riddance, you know, and good riddance, screw it, you know, we don't need it. The thing is, is that up until recently, right, this lost cause narrative was one of the prevailing uh, predominant elements of American, uh, you know, of hegemonic American patriotism. Um, the Confederacy was unquestionably memorialized. It just became part of um, the larger um, pantheon of American history. But what it ultimately ended up doing, especially among groups in the South, is that for, you know, however way you want to, you know, understand this, um, the end of the Civil War and the loss of slavery for the South somehow was turned into a victory because the true people emancipated were the white ruling class, right? The law, their loss or the end of the war, or the end of that era, right, emancipated them from the morally questionable institution of slavery, right? So the real victims during this pre-period were whites who just didn't know any better. So the South was reconstructed back into the cultural and historical anthology of the United States, right? An anthology which remained still under the control of whites. So the understanding that white Southerners are now finding newfound loyalty and patriotism within the larger United States is the big victory, right? Whites are now, part, we've, all dis we've all achieved some kind of major, major victory 
in unity. So the other thing is, let's talk about this again. The pursuit of national unity emphasizes conformity and group identity over socioeconomic and especially sociocultural dissent. So that is why even today, right, criticism of what is just lovingly referred to as Southern heritage is going to be interpreted as a criticism on American history and tradition itself, right? And this is not just a vocation of Southern conservatives, right? You might remember um, a couple of months ago, if you were anywhere near um, a Fox News broadcast, that, um, you know, the defacing of Confederate memorials, the removal of Confederate statues, um, either planned or pulled down by people, right, were seen as, you know, mob rule. And this is destruction of American history. And some people will even say, well, how will we remember the Confederacy if we don't have monuments to that? To which some people reply, there's not a single statue of Hitler in Germany, but Germans know exactly who this guy is. Um, but it's this knee-jerk reaction to what defenders of this have now see as something completely different, right? Completely different. And this is not to defend it, this is just simply to explain it. Those who um, are opponents of Confederate memorabilia will look at this and say racism and slavery. Those who have grown up in it with this, you know, culture as system that pervades the entire thing, right? You just don't even realize that, oh, there's a statue of Robert E. Lee. There's a boulevard named after um, Jefferson Davis. This college is named after uh, John C. Calhoun. It's like, you know, we don't even think about this. And look, let's be perfectly honest. We find, even here in the North, there are buildings, there are colleges, there are college dorm rooms that, you know, we don't think about the names. Um, but when someone actually decides to do the history, we find out, oh, this person actually was a slave owner. This person profited off of the slave trade. This person did this. This, this person did that. There's this one really, really crappy dorm um, building at Rutgers um, called Hardenburg Hall. And for years, right, no one bothered to figure out who Hardenburg was. Most of the time you ever think about the names of the buildings? No, you really don't. At some point, someone decided to figure out who Hardenberg was, and if I'm not mistaken, he actually was a slave owner. Now, all of a sudden, well, we got to change the name. Um, it was fine before, simply because it didn't matter. Nobody cared. Nobody bothered to think about it. So, hence the reason why the Lost Cause contribution continues to perpetuate the narratives that it did, because no one really called them out on it. And if there were people that did, they were marginalized, they didn't have a voice, you know, black groups. But even within black groups, some of them called for compromise, while others were more vociferous and saying, no compromise, no nothing, get rid of the whole thing, right? So the discontentment of marginalized groups, right, whether it's North or South, right, indicates their possible disloyalty to the country, right? So hence, as I said, the visceral reaction against all attempts at removing these symbols and bringing to light the true history of individuals instead of their socially accepted myths. So when people are actually trying to bring up actual history, when people are trying to demystify the myths, as I've said before, um, it is much more difficult to detach yourself from a myth mm -hmm. than it is just, you know, regular normal history right especially when doing so now means that one has to wonder what did my ancestors do <clears throat> right what did my ancestors fight for back then you know it's one thing to kind of just you know tell yourself in your mind okay i know that our family has <clears throat> you know a whole bunch of confederate war memorabilia and i don't really think about it you know everybody's got somebody back in the day that fought for this war or that war what have you, but when now the idea is, no, 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 the Confederacy needs to be expunged from American political culture, and it should have been expunged decades, maybe even a century ago, it is now not just the simple thing of removing the monuments, but also deconstructing the narratives, right? Deconstructing the culture that up to this point was pervasive, hegemonic, and for most people, commonsensical. Finally, what the Lost Cause um, narrative has done to larger understandings of hegemonic American patriotism is that it has entrenched a sense of understanding in both collective and, more importantly, historical memory that 
authoritarianism doesn't exist in the United States, right? This is what we do, right? American collective memory, and even more so American historical memory, will try as hard as it can to look at the most unsavory elements of this country's history and somehow reconstruct it to be something other than what people would otherwise see as authoritarian, criminal, tyrannical, unjust, and immoral, right? That doesn't happen in the United States, right? That happens in Russia, right? That happens in China, that happens in, you know, other parts of the world. Um, you know, slavery was something at the absolute worst that we finally realized we got over it. You know, we have a constitutional amendment that says we prohibit it. You know, it's something that, you know, you, you know, we, we, we met and we atoned for, right? That's that, that I think is the, um, uh, especially the, the, the prevailing narrative, not just among conservatives, but I think even among uh, mainstream liberals, right? We atoned for it, right? We gave them stuff afterwards, kind of like the whole way of, of, you know, we may have displaced uh, the indigenous population, but we put them on reservations, right? We didn't annihilate them, right? We didn't create Auschwitz. That's the thing, right? We're not Nazis, you know? We don't have gulags. We don't have concentration camps. So we can't possibly be bad guys. This is a sanitizing of history. And it's not particular to the United States, right? All countries do it to a certain extent. Um, but what the lost cause um, narrative specifically does is it, you know, lays down very clearly um, one non-negotiable truth, and that is the paramount importance of unity, particularly white unity across geographic areas of this country. And if that unity comes at the expense of the, marginaliz the marginalization of other groups, blacks, women, Latinos, and others, well, then that's just an unfortunate price to pay. Um, it's not that this is met with indifference, but the idea is that at the time, these marginalized groups simply did not have the organizational means to counter those narratives. And when there was um, elements of dissension and opposition in the South, it would be met swiftly, right, with intimidation, lynchings, beatings, murder. Um, those who could get out just did, right? That was the idea, right? The understanding was you're free. You don't have to stay here any longer. Um, but the idea is that we're not enslaving you, so we've done what more do you want type of thing, right? What more do you want? We need to heal the country. Um, and I think that that is um, one of the underlying elements of this more pervasive uh, model of American patriotism that looks down upon any kind of dissent, not just from the right, but especially in, you know, recently from the left, um, as somehow a dangerous element that points out the weaknesses and the missteps um, of these assumptions and these beliefs. And while I realize that we still have um, a number of examples to go through, I think I'm going to break this lecture up into two because we're already about an hour and 15 in. And I think that this is enough for us to digest in one sitting. So I'm going to do the Sugru, the Shorto, and the um, Server um, articles uh, in a separate lecture that builds on what we've talked about here with the entrenched narratives of unity and how dissension can either be co-opted or just simply demobilized uh, up until the current time. So stay tuned because we're just taking a quick intermission and I will be right back in a separate video. <laughs>